great. Um, in the end, uh, though, my hope is that the, this add-on is just brought into the core of Blender that every developer, add-on developer, uh, could take advantage of it. Uh, so this workshop is primarily aimed for add-on developers, um, aspiring and current, although uh, artists or uh, technical artists and, and, and the like um, um, might be able to, to benefit from this as well. So the focus here is to share some coding experience that we had, uh, much of the framework of Rotopa Flow um, is, is in cookie cutter, and so that's why I'm here to share. Um, and the method that I'm planning to disseminate this is to write, write an add-on uh, to solve a modeling problem um, and uh, to provide some anecdotes along the way, good practices, and my hope is that this is kind of a little bit interactive, um, that if you have some questions, feel free to, to uh, raise your hand. I'll, I'll um, be happy to, to pause. We have plenty of time um, to kind of work through some stuff, although I do want to give the Blender developers uh, a chance to come in um, at the end, so I definitely won't, won't run over. All right, so as an aside, uh, many of the problems that we solved in uh, Retopa Flow can be broken down into three parts. 90% of the problem is the geometry. Um, so how does the tool does its magic? 90% um, is also the UI and UX, so how does the user interact with this tool? Uh, and annoyingly, about 20% of it is the glue that holds everything together. Um, and this is where um, cookie cutter comes in, uh, into play. So disclaimer, I am not at all an artist. I uh, don't even claim, that's why I write programs to draw for me, because I cannot. Um, I know the basics of modeling. Um, mostly I know when you hit extrude, what actually happens to the mesh. Uh, but that's about it. That's about the extent of things. So I am uh, far from the artist. But I have been using this um, disclaimer as a superpower of some sort. Um, I uh, ask tons and tons of questions. So I've, I spoke with many of you um, already and uh, many in the past. Um, about you know, what do you do, what sort of problems do you run into, um, um, do you have any ideas on how to solve them, uh, how does this interact with other things. And the reason why I do this is because I'm not an artist, I don't understand what the artists run into, um, but I have a skill set that I can be able to um, provide um, possibly a solution, I just need to know how do you work with it. And going back to this slide right here, I know that ni first 90%, it's the UI and UX uh, part of it that, um, that I need to figure out. Uh, and that's where, where artists come in. So I'll ask you tons and tons of questions. Um, Jonathan Williamson has been excessively patient with me because I'll ask him over and over again, what does this mean? What do you do in this situation? What does this context mean? Um, but just as a little tip to artists in the room or listening later, Learn a bit of coding, um, because it can help you be able to communicate with the developers um, along the way. So when you're running into a problem, if you can express it in uh, not necessarily a coding fashion, if you do this and this and this, it'll solve the problem, but you'll be able to, you, the communication will just be uh, much clearer, um, and the solutions tend to just kind of pop out uh, most of the time, not all problems. Um, some of them are, are actually genuinely pretty hard. Okay, so uh, modeling problems. Uh, in general, I uh, look at modeling problems as mostly being a problem of labeling. So modeling problems is definitely a pun. Um, how do you model prob problems? So uh, the question is, you know, uh, how do I label the geometry that I'm going to be manipulating or changing? And, um, and then what do I need to do uh, to update that? So if you start off by labeling your geometry well, um, uh, then the technical side of the problem, um, this 90% right there, kind of goes away. Um, not always, but, uh, but it, gets, it gets pretty close to being done. Um, and when I mean labeling, I am actually meaning like putting numbers on things or labeling, you know, this is uh, gonna have the, the name top or bottom or right or left or something like this, Bob or cat or something. Um, but um, but again, just being able to describe all the parts and how things kind of play into it um, uh, will 
will solve uh, the problem very quickly. Okay. One other note, many of you, uh, the uh, add-on developers probably already know this, but P Python is a very general programming language. Um, with all of its packages, Python is very powerful. Um, it's not the slowest language out there, or uh, not the fastest language out there, it's not the slowest either. Uh, but, um, uh, but it can do a lot of things. Um, basically anything you can do in C, you can do in Python. And with Blender's API, the Python API, it sort of gives Python an even larger set of functions to its disposal. Um, so you can be able to process and manipulate data, for example, a mesh, but uh, a blend file is just a database um, of, of relations and, and, and information. Uh, so basically whatever you have access to and can be able to manipulate, you can be able to do of stuff to it. Um, the uh, Blender also gives uh, or exposes some of the internal functionality. Um, now there are packages like for example OpenGL and fonts um, that uh, you can be able to access outside of Blender. Uh, but within Blender, if you want it to be able to draw things on there, um, you need to have sort of key functionality into, um, into the system. Um, and so they, they provide that, um, although the OpenGL stuff is changing with, uh, with 2.0, uh, 2.8. Um, but also, and this is the coolest thing, I think, is ability to be able to extend Blender to, uh, through add-ons, so being able to uh, create that widget that does these operations for you. Um, but Add-on development is still kind of wild west, I think. Um, there are some good tutorials out there, uh, but there aren't a lot of, um, there, there are a lot of very simple add-ons. Uh, there's been a growing population of more complex add-ons, um, but um, I, I feel like the community can probably do a little bit better um, in, in communicating across there. So. I mentioned uh, the first version of Rotopa Flow ran into a lot of, a lot of problems. Uh, these tools, contours and polystrips in particular, started off as very modest modal operators. Um, they had a very limited set of operations. They didn't do a whole lot in interacting with one another. You sort of entered the modal a bit like a fancy knife, um, knife tool. Uh, and then eventually you committed it and that's when the changes happened. Um, but as these add-ons, these separate add-ons kind of grew and matured, um, they, uh, we needed to be able to communicate between them, um, be able to switch very quickly between contours and poly strips. And, uh, and the problems that we ran into were not necessarily with contours and poly strips, but in the way that we're sharing that information. So going back to that glue, how, does, how do the parts uh, work together? So we ended up creating uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it frameworks, but um, a, um, a large set of functions to be able to help us be able uh, to focus on the development where it was important, and that was at 90% of the, the artists. So um, it's fine that um, you, you can do uh, model, model manipulation, uh, surfaces and modeling type of, of editing, uh, but having, you know, 100 buttons over there is not very artist friendly. Um, need to be able to know what the workflow is and work it into there. Uh, but probably mo most importantly, when an artist comes to a tool, what makes the most sense? What is intuitive for them uh, to be able to do uh, the work that they need? And that's where that tool should step in and provide uh, functionality. Um, and just as a footnote, I, I actually ran this this morning. Uh, there's a tool to count the number of lines of code in a program. And uh, Rotopaflow had, at present, 24,000 lines of Python code, which is ridiculous um, amount of, of code. Uh, but 11,000 of that was just Rotopaflow tools, um, and 7,000 went to the, the glue that holds it all together. Um, so this is, this is what I want to talk about. All right, so here's the problem we're going to tackle uh, in the next 40 or so minutes. Um, Jonathan came to me, well actually we were, we were running uh, at, the, at the latest retreat, and uh, he said on the way while I was catching my breath um, that uh, he frequently uses the extrude tool to extrude out some faces, but then he'll almost always follow it up with a loop cut. So he'll bring it out and then loop cut along the way. And he had said, uh, wouldn't it be nice to have just one tool that sort of does both? And I thought, hey, that sounds like a great tool 
uh, to talk about. It's a very simple uh, gluing together of tools. Um, so I hope that um, uh, I, I picked this one so it wouldn't be too difficult, too much of a challenge, it wouldn't be too long. Um, but it's challenging enough, hopefully you can see where Cookie Cutter can come in to uh, extend even more advanced uh, operators um, and tools. All right, so this is the problem that we have. We have some geometry, we want to be able to do some stuff to it. Um, the first thing we need to do is be able to label uh, these things. Uh, so I'm going to, hopefully this doesn't break, come down here and we're gonna open Blender, there we go. And let's do this. Um, I want to start labeling some things. Again, I'm not an artist, so I'm gonna be very clunky with the um, um, grease pencil, but hopefully you'll, you can forgive me for that. All right, so grease pencil, we wanna be able to draw and we wanna do it on the surface. Okay, so suppose that this is the, um, the model that we're working in, um, working on, we're in edit mode. Uh, and this is what the artist had selected. So they're wanting to uh, extrude this out along here, you know, to some, uh, some measure, and then apply loop cuts to the outside, um, maybe one uh, cut, maybe three, who knows, uh, but to be able to, to do that. But have it all in one step. And uh, Jonathan also mentions that it'd be nice to not only do these two operations like this to specify exactly how many cuts, but maybe instead you specify how uh, distant the cuts need to be, and then uh, the number of cuts b is based off of that. So this is where the tool can, um, can come, in, uh, come in well. All right, so going back to here. Again, this is the surface that we're trying to uh, extrude. So I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time talking about um, uh, labeling, and hopefully that will, um, when, when we get to the code part, it'll kind of make sense where it all fits together. So, and again, if you have questions, just yell out to me or something like that. Okay, so we have um, these three faces selected, uh, but in addition to that, we have a bunch of edges and a bunch of points. Uh, so one thing we might want to do is just give, uh, assign everything a, uh, a number. So um, what number it is at this point, I don't think it really matters, um, but we'll just go ahead and number them. Uh, we're, we're computer scientists, we should start numbering at zero. So we have uh, zero, one, and two, just label the faces, and then maybe we'll go in and label the, label the edges. So, uh, so here's edge uh, zero, and then maybe um, edge one, and two, and three, and so on. So I'm also doing this with the mouse, so my hand is terrible. I was thinking about ringing the tablet, but okay. So we have um, all the edges, and I'm skip the uh, vertices for now. Um, but having these labeled um, now gives us um, uh, give it, gives us some way to be able to uh, name each of these things. Now, <clears throat> what happens when we do um, we do the extrude? So when we extrude, there's a couple ways uh, to look at it, but one of the, uh, a few different ways to, to look at how the operation actually um, happens under the hood. Um, and right now, I'm just kind of ignoring UVs, uh, the colors of the vertices, everything else. So I'm just focusing on uh, the geometry itself. Um, but one thing is, well, as this comes up, you can almost think of this as, instead, it is, um, what is it, split? We're splitting this face off, which all these labeled um, faces, so we have our two, zero, and one, and so forth, they just kind of move up, right? So the numbers are still there uh, for the faces, zero, one, and two. Those are still there. But what does change is, are the edges. So this edge that was labeled eight now is in two places. We have, uh, we have this eight here, we'll call it eight prime, but we also have this nine here, which is nine prime and so forth, right? So we have some duplication that, that happens on some of the geometry, uh, but also the, the vertices too. So each of the vertices was, uh, were duplicated um, along the way. But that doesn't happen all the time, right? Um, so let me, uh, let's do this. Let's undo, oh, how do I get, there we go, all right. So, <clears throat> 
what happens if we do that? And we follow the same, same procedure. So we go in and we do a split and we shift this up. All the faces still get moved up, just the same as before. Uh, but now we have a difference. The, some of the edges were duplicated, all the ones along the outside. So if I uh, uh, do this, all the edges along the outside were duplicated, along with the vertices, but none, none of the geometry that's in the middle. So this vertex here, there's only w exactly one of them. And each of these edges, there's exactly one of them. They, they moved on up with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the faces. And I suppose one other um, way, uh, situation might be if you had, for example, this edge extruded out and you extruded this face. Uh, so um, you could think of um, this is following the same procedure or another way to look at this, Blender uh, took a slightly different uh, approach, but um, it could fill in uh, this, this void right here, this box. So it's just a couple ways to look at it. And in the, at that point, it would be important to talk with the artist to figure out, okay, when you do this operation, what does it mean? Um, should this be filled in? Should it not? So if you're extruding a, 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 a plane, there's no um, inside or outside. Um, there's just the plane. Uh, should it extrude out of volume or should it uh, follow the, uh, the same procedure as, um, as if it was a volume? All right, so we have, um, have a few things to work with here. So some of the geometry will be duplicated, everything that's along the edges, um, the outside, everything that's in the middle and all the selected faces are going to be uh, cut or split and pulled up uh, together as, as a group. Okay, does it kind of make sense so far? Just kind of labeling, okay. Um, one other thing that I'm going to mention, um, just because it will, it will show up um, here soon, a lot of the tools in Blender are considered modal. So you have, uh, for example, your knife. So now we're in the knife tool, we're doing stuff, and this stays in this, in this tool until either you commit it with an enter or you escape it and you cancel it out. Um, but this knife tool is also inside of another mode. We're inside of edit mode. Um, uh, so we have uh, this kind of layering of different modes. And when we were working on uh, RetopoFlow, RetopoFlow itself is just like the knife tool, but all of the tools within it, um, so say for example, I'm gonna just pull it up real quick. So now we're in modal operator, the RetopoFlow, but inside of that we have the polypen tool selected. Uh, so we have this nesting and nesting and nesting of these, you know, what state are we in? And so there is a, um, there is a uh, common computer science term uh, that we use uh, called finite state machine um, that allows us to be able to model this sort of problem. And it, uh, it's one of the problems that we ran to many, many times in Rutopoflow. I mean, each one of the tools has its own state. And even when you're inside of one of the states, uh, so, let me uh, just jump back in here. So uh, if I grab this and start moving it, now we're inside of a state, inside of a state, inside of a state, and so forth. Uh, so we needed to be able to solve, uh, solve this problem. And just as a very quick primer, uh, um, the, here's my little handy tool. All right, uh, so a finite state machine, you could think of as uh, a bunch of states. So we may have a main state and we may have, say, a grab state, a G state. And when we uh, hit the G key, we're gonna move from the main to the G state, uh, main to the grab state, and when we hit, uh, say, return to commit, or maybe escape, uh, we want to be able to leave it, right? So we're gonna have these, uh, these different states, and maybe there's another one inside of here, so maybe we're grabbing along the X. And so when we hit X, we go in here. When we hit something, uh, hit X again or something like this, uh, maybe it just jumps back to the general G state. So <clears throat> these, uh, these states in our system, we can model them as functions that are, that are, that are happening. And then these uh, transition states, we'll model them as, um, 
uh, w those will be dependent on what the function will return. So hopefully this will make sense uh, here in just a moment. Okay, so here is the experiment. Hopefully this will work. All right, I have uh, created this tool already. Actually, let me show it to you. Uh, so this tool I already created once, just as a prototype uh, to see if it would work. So I have uh, two big extruders. Uh, this is the one that is the full feature. Uh, there's still some missing things to it. But this is kind of the target what we're working for. So we have uh, these items selected. We will want to transition into, start this tool, and it's going to take over some of the drawing of, of, the, of the tool here. Um, and you can pull out and pull in, um, so you can adjust the, you know, the displacement of the extrusion. You can also adjust the, uh, the counts of the segments along the side, but you can also specify its length. So how long do you want each segment uh, along here to be? And so if I switch it from count to length, then this will um, create a new edge about every uh, 0 0.5. And it's from the, the top edge there. So 0 0.5 down and so forth, roughly. OK. Um, and then if you push the control key when you move, then it snaps to, to that uh, length segment. When you hit enter, it commits, and it is actually extruded out, so it's uh, not just new geometry. And the previous uh, faces that were in there, were, they were pulled up. Um, but it also allows you to um, go in and say, for example, hit escape and cancel it, and goes back. So this is the goal. And I really wanted to be able to uh, answer questions, but also talk while I'm doing this. Uh, and this program here was, um, uh, it was a little bit longer than what I had hoped for. Um, and so what I decided to do at noon today was record myself doing this. And I uh, did that using a tool that I literally threw together in the last few hours. So I'm hoping that it'll work. Um, all right, so here let's start off with a blank uh, setup. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over the, the basic setup for, for uh, um, registering a, um, a new add-on. Um, and what I'm going to do is just start with this basic code. It, can everybody read that okay? Make it a little bigger? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, um, so this is uh, copy and paste uh, of, of just the basic stuff. We're importing a bunch of, of things. Um, so OS to be able to manipulate um, the uh, operating system and look at paths and whatnot. Um, uh, math to be able to do uh, some basic math. Time to get the time. Some of these we um, might not actually need. But we'll also import uh, BGL to be able to do some drawing on there. Uh, BPY so we can interact with uh, Blender. Uh, BMesh, uh, we're actually going to do all the manipulations in, in BMesh as opposed to edit mesh. Uh, and then we have a few things, uh, uh, intersect line line, which is actually not intersecting, but it's finding uh, the two closest points on two lines um, in three-dimensional space. Um, and then some additional things for the uh, cookie cutter. So again, this isn't polished up. Uh, ideally, this would just be um, um, an import from a single location, um, but presently I just kind of have it scattered. Um, but I will um, work in to clean it up. So the basic setup is this. Um, normally you would have operator, BPY types operator here. Um, but instead we're gonna be extending cookie cutter. And I'm, is that shifting going to bother anybody? If so, I can just alt tab between. Okay, let me know if it if it's, um, becomes an issue. But in cookie cutter, um, there we go. Um, Cookie cutter is an operator. And so anytime you extend cookie cutter, you're, you're already creating an operator. Um, but it also extends cookie cutter UI and FSM and utils. UI handles a lot of the user interaction stuff. Um, I'll get to that uh, uh, very soon. FSM is for the finite state machine to be able to handle transitioning between the different states, grab and so forth. Uh, and then utils is just some basic uh, utilities. Um, there are, 
are a few differences between uh, cookie cutter and operator, so it's not a, a direct one-to-one, -one, um, but it, it's pretty close. Um, so instead of having a poll function in your uh, operator, um, uh, um, this here will call a can start state. And I also changed the language just a little bit because um, I always had to think, what does poll mean? What does it invoke, invoke mean and execute? And I just tried to use a normal, uh, normal language uh, for that. So these methods here, you will, um, you will override. Um, you'll write your own versions. Can start, start, update, and so forth. If you don't, um, it just does a default of nothing. All right, so when, uh, when it's pulling, it calls can start to see if it can actually start. Um, this one right here just automatically says true, uh, so it's not doing anything. Uh, and then when the operator is invoked, then it does some initialization, calls start, and sets everything up for a modal operator. So we'll, we'll get to that in, in just a moment. Um, so these, in terms of the operator, they should be very familiar. Uh, BLID name, uh, be a label for uh, the label that goes on to the, the button, uh, where that button is located, so the view 3D and the tools, uh, and then a description for your tool tips when you hover your, your mouse over it. So this right here is not gonna do um, anything quite yet. Um, but when you add in something, um, uh, a main state, then that's when things start happening. So if you're not familiar with um, this notation, this is a uh, Python's decorator. Um, it allows you to pass this function to another function, and it allows it to pretty it up and do some fancy stuff under the hood. Um, if, you're, that's, if you're curious, that's where uh, this file, the cookie cutter FSM, comes in. Um, and it's not too long, but it does some uh, some magic stuff of, of keeping track of which state you're in and how do you transition between them. So with just this alone, we have, it's, uh, this button right here is the, this code as it currently is. It does absolutely nothing. It immediately, it starts the, uh, the tool, uh, starts it in, but then immediately it says it's done and finishes. All right, so not very interesting. What's that? Nice job, yes. And also, um, it does not uh, know the difference between being in edit mode or not. Um, so adding in um, the proper can start into it um, will um, inform it when it should be shown and when it should not be, uh, or when it should be accessible and when it should not be accessible. Um, all right, so this is uh, just making sure that an object's selected, it's a mesh, and that we are indeed in edit mode there okay next so the next thing is uh, filling out the start so let's do something a little bit more interesting we'll start collecting what data uh, is uh, going to be manipulated so um, the context as you might have noticed is not actually passed to the functions it's actually stored um, in the object uh, in the cookie cutter object itself so you have have always access to the context. You just say self.context. Um, I found it a bit troublesome to always have to pass it around and remember to pass it, and so I decided I'm just gonna stuff it into the object, uh, and it updates every time uh, uh, the event or you know, the, the invoke, uh, or the execute gets called, and so forth. So, um, but we're gonna grab a reference to the object, to the edit mesh, and then create a B mesh of the, of the object that uh, is being manipulated. And then we're going to look at all of the faces that are selected. So this is just scanning through, finding all the selected faces, and we're going to collect also all of the edges that belong to the faces and all the vertices that belong to the faces. And the reason why I did that is so that if, for example, uh, a face and, uh, let's see here, Select that face. No, 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 it's not what I want. There, there we go. So if I have a face selected and an edge, I don't want to uh, include this one. I'm just gonna focus in on this one. That's, that's the only difference uh, there. Next, we're gonna get the um, inner and outer parts to this. So remember when, um, when we're looking at what happens when we uh, pull this up, when we do a split, for example, this is going to move up all the faces 
but it's going to duplicate all the outer geometry, but not the inner geometry. So we need to be able to distinguish between the two. So all I have here is a way of labeling. So rather than giving it 0, 1, 2, and so forth, I am looking at all of the edges that have uh, more than one face uh, linked to it. So it's touching more than one face. Um, and that all of those faces that it's touching are, um, are selected. They are the, the faces that we're, we're interested in moving. So these are all the inner edges. The outer edges, they have at least one face that's not selected. Uh, so all of the, ed all of the edges t in total um, that are connected to the selected faces, we're going to subtract away the inner ones and we're left with the outer ones. Uh, and then we basically do the same thing for the outer uh, vertices there. I just have this little print thing to make sure that everything's working. So um, anytime you're, you're doing work in geometry, um, you should always um, uh, test that what you're trying to do is actually what you're intending to do. Uh, so here, this is going to print out all, uh, all the faces, so the number of faces that are counted, um, all the edges, and all the vertices. And when we run it, it still is just finishing as soon as it um, executes, but it should print out to the console 4129 uh, for the number of faces, the number of edges, and the number of, of vertices. And if we wanted to, we could look at just the, um, just the outer edges. Whoops. My keyboard is a little funny. All, uh, so count the outer edges and all the outer uh, vertices as well. Um, so if we do that, So we should get uh, one face, four outer fa uh, edges, and four vertices. But if we select these, we should get four faces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, uh, 11, 12 total edges. But there are only eight that are on the outside. So if we run this, it, we should get an eight for the second number. And hey, all right, so everything is working so far. So it's not including these four edges, nor the vertex that's in the middle. So we're good. All right, so let's move on to next. Um, the next thing let's do, let's go ahead and hide the geometry. Since we're going to be rendering that extruded uh, geometry out, we'll just go ahead and hide it so that Blender doesn't render it, and we'll take over um, that. So this is just going through all of the, all the faces, all the inner edges, and all the inner vertices, um, and hides them. So it's not going to hide any of the outer geometry. So if we have um, these selected, it'll hide all the faces, and this vertex, and all these edges here, but not any of the outside, which hasn't been duplicated yet. So we should get a hole. That's not really a hole. You can unhide them or reveal them. Uh, they're still there. They're just hidden. All right. So the next thing we want to do is know, as we're extruding along, which direction are we going to go? So this is doing just a little bit of math of adding up all the normals of the faces uh, that have been selected. It's going to find a center location, so it's going to uh, find the average of all of the vertices. Um, and then this point one is just some point that's along a direction from point zero. We'll talk about what, uh, what that's useful for in just a moment. And then this is just a variable to hold how far we've displaced um, the uh, the surface so far. So we're just gathering some information. So in addition to a start, there's also going to be an end function in the cookie cutter. So whenever cookie cutter starts, this function is called. Whenever cookie cutter ends, whether you cancel or commit, uh, this function gets called. And so what I'm doing here, I am um, uh, inside of the modal main. I'm going to set the cursor to be a crosshair. And then when we end, I'm just going to restore, restore it to whatever, um, whatever it happened to have been when cookie cutter, uh, the, the operator, uh, started. Um, and then I have these two wonderful little things. So this is for our state transitions. Um, another thing that we had to deal with in Rotopa Flow was handling user input, uh, keyboard and mouse and so forth. Um, and it became a pain to have to deal with left shift and, and uh, left click and pushing all these different keys, and when did you release the key? So we created um, a user actions um, container, an object, 
that processes all the event information. It keeps track of where the mouse is, where the mouse was when, it, when you left click to down, um, which keys are currently pressed, ha, uh, did you just release a key, it keeps track of all those, and it gives some nice functionality into being able to test, was this button pressed, or is this button being used, um, and so forth. So we're, uh, these are standard um, event um, types, or the, the, the strings um, to specify what key was being pressed, so here's return, here's escape. So when uh, the user hits return, we want to say we're done. When the user hits escape, we want to say we're done, but we're going to cancel. But if not, we're going to just keep, keep in, uh, staying in here. So when we save this, we should get into, we have, we're inside of the modal operator, um, and when we hit escape, it jumps back to, so now we're back in um, uh, standard Blender mode here. Still not doing very much. Um, so we'll just continue. All right, so this one, we're going to add a header text just so that um, we know when we're in the state and when we're not, and when we leave, we're going to restore. And let's start drawing some things. So I've um, created here a, uh, a draw post view function. The name actually really doesn't matter. What does matter is it's decorator. So anytime you want to draw um, some geometry on the screen, either in 3D or in 2D, and either before Blender does a drawing or after Blender does its drawing, um, you use this uh, decorator, which adds it as a, as a handler. The nice thing about this is you can uh, collect a whole bunch of these, and, and, um, and the cookie cutter will be able to handle it. But uh, this is just basic OpenGL stuff. We're going to turn on blending so we can have alpha values, and we're going to draw a line that starts at uh, 0 0.0 and goes uh, in the negative direction by 1,000, and then uh, in the positive direction by 1,000, it's going to draw a line. So if we look at what this does real quick, now we have this purple line that's extending and it's uh, aligned along with the, with the normal of the, uh, the selected geometry. Uh, some fancier drawing of lines. Um, I'm just gonna skip, skip ahead uh, a little bit more. Here we're gonna start drawing the faces of the, uh, the geometry that's gonna be uh, split and, and shifted up. Uh, so we're gonna draw them as triangles. Did this an awful lot of um, you know, taking an n-gon and, and uh, triangulate, triangulating it so that we can draw it using uh, GL triangles. Um, the other thing I think I updated was, oh, 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 hold on. That's not extending along there, but what it is going to do is replace the, the gray geometry that was there with this yellow one that's along here. Next, I'm going to start creating all of the additional geometry for the extrusion. So we need some placeholders to hold some information. And then another thing that we did uh, very often was some of the computations were very expensive. Uh, so you only want to do them when you have to. Uh, so I have a, a dirty flag to indicate whether or not I need to recompute these entities. But if we're just rotating around um, or uh, doing nothing, don't continue to recompute them. So whenever this is dirty is, uh, is set, then it's going to recompute. And one of the other functions in Cookie Editor that you override is update, which gets called every time. So in here, this is a great place to do um, your, your updating. So if it's not dirty, just return. Otherwise, go through and create a bunch of vertices that are where the original vertices, the outer vertices were, but extruded along the direction by whatever extrude distance happens to be. Uh, and then uh, we'll draw some edges in there just so that you can see what's, what's happening. I think I have a couple more. So I updated the extrude distance to 0 0.5, so it does extrude along there. And I added in some code to draw some vertices and draw some edges and also draw some faces. Um, these faces, though, are based on the original, not on the new, um, so it'll stay put. One other little tip. Anytime you're, well, drawing geometry on top of other geometry is really, really hard. Uh, Retopoflow, we did a lot of 
black magic to make it work okay, it's not perfect. Um, it's just a really, really hard problem. Um, so one way, one cheap way to be able to do this is normally your depth range is between zero and one. Uh, so the farther away objects are at roughly one. It's inverted, but, uh, or well, it's at one. The near objects are at zero. And so what you do is you just say, well, we're just gonna scooch this in just a little bit. So everything you draw is gonna be slightly pushed towards the front plane. So if two pieces of geometry are at the same distance from the viewer, it sort of pushes it ahead, um, pushes the vertices slightly ahead of the faces and edges slightly ahead as well. So with this, we should have this. So we're drawing the, uh, the edges pushed out along uh, the direction here. Um, still have some, have some ways to go, but we're, we're moving along there. Um, next, uh, let's see. So here we're uh, extruding the faces along the direction now, so um, we should be able to draw the extruded faces. They should move out along there. Um, play along, let's see. Uh, the next one here, we are um, allowing a new mode here. So I had said we had our main mode, which is what uh, Cookie Cutter starts in on, but we may want to transition to another one, and specifically when you hit the G key on, on grab in, uh, in edit mode, you're, you're moving into grab uh, a modal state. Here we want to have a display state, so we're going to move that uh, extruded geometry out. Uh, and we're going to transition into the state whenever the left mouse button is clicked. So anytime in these functions, if you return a string, it's, cookie cutter is going to assume that that's the next state you're wanting to go into. And the states are specified by these parameters to the decorators here. So when you pass in a displace, or you return a displace from here, the next time your, uh, your tool is being used, it's going to call uh, the displace mode here. And it'll stay in here until this returns a different state, in this case, main, which will be called whenever, or, uh, returns whenever left mouse button is clicked, uh, re is released. So if we look at this, it should allow us to left click and, no, not yet, not yet. Let's try that. Nope. Hopefully this isn't my hack that's work broken. It is, what's going on? We'll advance it forward a little bit. Oh. There we go, all right, hooray. So it's moving the geometry along, but uh, it's not doing the extrusion. So all we're doing is basically splitting the geometry and moving along. But now we have uh, the data in a way that we can start playing with it and start creating some stuff uh, with it. We have things labeled, so we know that this vertex has a, a number, um, and we have a number for this vertex as well. And so when we want to uh, do the loop cut along here, say we're putting in two segments, one here and one here, so we need to find a point that's roughly in the middle, uh, or exactly in the middle of these two points here. And if we know the label of this vertex and the vertex of this one, then we can very easily compute uh, the middle point in there. So let me skip along a little bit more here. And we've got some edges we're extruding. So at this point, we have um, these edges being drawn. Uh, we have uh, these edges, so this is actual uh, this is a data structure that mimics uh, the geometry that's going to be uh, um, generated. The math of it is not too complicated um, once you kind of break it down into its components. Uh, but we're just creating a bunch of vertices here. We have um, our inner vertices, which are just being moved, and then our outer vertices, which are being subdivided uh, along the way. So we're, we're making n plus, uh, n plus one uh, vertices along there. And then the edges are just hooking up the, the two numbers to one another. Skipping forward a little bit more here. I'm 
Now we're actually drawing the, uh, the geometry of the faces. So we have the, the original faces that were being extruded out, so that's the yellow part up here. That's stored, in this case, under self-die-extrude faces. Uh, and then under the, the, for the green, which are the edges, um, that's being loop cut, um, this is under uh, extrude sides, um, so that we can be able, I separated them out so that we can be able to color them uh, differently here. Um, and one thing, one other thing which uh, I skipped over um, in trying to find something that was pulling out. The end function is always called when the tool is being finished, uh, but end commit is called whenever you're, uh, the user, the artist wanted to commit the data uh, to, the, uh, to the mesh. So this function here only is called when, um, when you hit the enter key uh, to commit the data. And what this is doing is it's deleting the previously selected geometry, but only the inner uh, edges and inner vertices, not the outer. Uh, and then it, uh, based on the visualization, all this data right here, so these are actual vertis, uh, vertex uh, vertices, these are edges, these are faces that are in there. So all we're doing is just recreating the, the B-mesh uh, vertices, B-mesh faces, and because faces have edges, the edges are automatically created along the way. Um, so this bit right here is actually creating the, the new geometry of, uh, of the, from the extrude and loop cut. And then this bit is just uh, selecting um, everything so that we are uh, selecting the extruded part here, which is the original selection that we had before. Uh, we just pulled it out to here. One other thing um, that I would like to, uh, to show is um, over here. So in the, in the full version of the extruder, uh, the code is a little bit more complicated because it's doing a little bit more along the way. Uh, but I do want to show um, the, uh, the UI stuff, um, adding that in there, and then I'll hand things over to the Blender developers. Um, so we're gathering all the, the same information from before, so that's nothing that's new. Um, but what is new is this bit down, well, the, these functions, but this bit right here. So this is, um, uh, in RetopaFlow, we wanted to have a special feel, um, a look and feel for Retopology. Um, we wanted it to feel distinct from edit mode, um, just the same way as sculpt mode feels different and object mode feels different and so forth, and weight paint and, and whatnot. So we wanted to give it its own mode feel. Uh, and so in part of doing that, uh, and also because we're running in modal, interacting with the uh, operators, like the buttons along the side, becomes really tricky. So we actually wrote our own UI system. It's ridiculous, um, and hopefully uh, 2.80 will uh, allow you to be able to do this without using uh, a, ho uh, a homegrown version. Um, but uh, this system allows you to be able to create windows that may or may not be movable, you can, you can specify. Um, you can make them sticky to different parts of the screen or you can specify their position um, exactly. And these are just very simple UI systems. You just add new ent entries, it appends it to the bottom uh, of the list uh, and it grows the window as more uh, entries go in there. But um, there are lots of different UI elements uh, for just regular labels, there are buttons, uh, but there are also numbers. Uh, numbers are useful for being able to, to show floating numbers or, or integers. Um, but the way you interact with them um, has to be done through functions, callback functions. So these functions up here are uh, returning the extrude distance, so how far the artist has specified to extrude it. And the set distance is the artist has changed the value of the extrude disk, um, you need to update it. So this is um, given the, the value um, and it turns it into a float because it'll actually be a string. Uh, and it marks the is dirty flag so that the next time update gets called, it can update the geometry along the way. Um, another uh, nice little feature are frames. Frames are just ways of collecting um, things. Uh, so we, we can have one label of segments and then we can just have count and, and length. And then there are options, uh, being able to select between uh, a fixed set of multiple things. So really, this bit of code, plus their associated functionality, is the only thing that is required to get um, this window to show up. Everything else about moving this window around, 
about making it sticky to the top left corner or the, the bottom right corner and so forth. That all is handled automatically by cookie cutter. Um, being able to, uh, to click and drag these values also, um, it has a very simple editing um, ability as well. So you can actually click on it, uh, change it um, uh, by typing it in. Um, the options, uh, selecting between them. This is all handled uh, automatically. In fact, um, even in uh, Retopo Flow, that we have multiple windows here. We have uh, the tool system up here. We have uh, a little um, welcome panel down here. And we have our general options, which are uh, collapsible. Um, and depending on your settings, you can collapse and open uh, based on which tool is selected. So. All of this is, again, homegrown, um, but it, it solved a really interesting uh, problem for us. Again, it was at 20%, but it was bringing the, uh, the tool to the, the artist and making it intuitive for them to be able to, uh, to, be able to do their work um, along the way. We have a few other things that are packed away in the cookie cutter. Um, so if you have more questions about what, what all is available, just uh, come and uh, grab me at any time. I'll be uh, around for the rest of the evening, but also I will be at the Blender Institute um, tomorrow. I'll be visiting there. So thank you for your uh, attention. If you want cookie cutter, there's a, it's on GitHub. So. <laughs>